Thank you very much, Arlene, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my congratulations, of course, to the Hunter Valley Research Foundation uh, on achieving this milestone of their 50th lunch after, I think, 57 years in existence. Uh, their research career is only one year less than mine. <laughs> I remember when they were established. Uh, what a 50-year period, what a 57-year period to have been examining life in the Hunter Valley. Uh, or more broadly, what a fantastic half century to have been engaged in observing Australian society in one of the most exciting periods of our social evolution. It's been a time in the last 50 years of such radical redefinition of what Australia is and what it means to be an Australian that I think it's fair to describe this as a revolutionary period. Uh, we haven't had bloodshed, uh, we haven't had some of the marks of other revolutions around the world, but ours has been no less radical. In fact, I think the best way to characterise Australia over the last 50 years is to say that we've been in the grip of four simultaneous radical revolutions, any one of which would have been enough to jolt us and make us rethink uh, this nation of ours, but four at once has been quite a challenge uh, and has been too much for some Australians to cope with and they're still trying to cope. The four revolutions I'm referring to are not uniquely ours but we have our own unique take on them. The gender revolution, arguably the greatest of the revolutions of the last 50 years, uh, the new wave of fem feminism, fundamentally, uh, calling on us to fundamentally rethink the roles of men and women in our society, and of course that revolution is far from over. The economic revolution that has seen us restructure our economy, I don't have to mention that to people from the Hunter, but of course it's been a national revolution as well. The information technology revolution that has fundamentally changed the way we work, the way we communicate, the way we live, uh, and a revolution in our sense of who we are, a cultural identity revolution. Now, that all sounds fairly glib. Let me very quickly flash some snapshots at you that will give you some specific indicators of the impact of those revolutions uh, during this 50-year period that we're reviewing. 50 years ago, let, let's start with marriage. 50 years ago, 75% of Australians were married by the age of 30. Today, about 35% are married by the age of 30. 50 years ago, by the way, this is a statistic, if, you, if you're ever with a room full of 20-year-old women and you want to shock them, tell them this. 50 years ago, 25% of Australian women were married by the age of 20. Today, 3% are married by the age of 20. But 50 years ago, there was a huge stigma attached to divorce in Australia. Only about 7 or 8% of marriages ever ended in divorce. Today, the Institute of Family Studies is estimating that about 40% of contemporary marriages will end in divorce. Uh, in fact, our changing behaviour in relation to marriage and divorce uh, and our, the, the, the famous reluctance of the rising generation of young Australians to marry uh, calls into question whether marriage has gone out of fashion. Uh, clearly it hasn't, although the distribution of marriage use has changed dramatically. It's a high fashion activity among some people who love getting married so much they keep doing it. Uh, and so we're now at the stage where for the rising generation we can estimate that the marriage market will reflect many consumer markets. There'll be about a third who will never marry, the non-users, There'll be about a third light users who'll marry once and about a third heavy users who'll marry uh, two or more times. We wouldn't have been talking like that 50 years ago or even 30 years ago. 50 years ago, the birth rate was just coming off the post-war baby boom. It ran for 15 years from 1946 to 61 and then fell away quite sharply. It's been falling away ever since. But but then the birth rate was about 3.5, 3.6 babies per woman. It is now exactly half that. Uh, people talk about a mini baby boom at the moment because the birth rate recently staggered up 
from 1.7 babies per woman to 1.8 babies per woman, still way below replacement level. Uh, we're going to die out if it were not for immigration if we leave it long enough at a birth rate at uh, this level. But 50 years ago it was twice that, uh, and now, as I say, uh, we're, well, we're producing uh, at the moment the smallest generation, relative to total population, the smallest generation of children Australia has ever produced. Fifty years ago, most kids were born to mothers under the age of 30. About 90% of babies were born to women under the age of 30. Now, about 90% of babies are born to women over the age of 30. The average age of the mother at the birth of the first child has moved in this period from 21 or 22 to 31 and heading towards 32 at the moment. We can't keep going, of course, because nature steps in. Uh, fundamental shifts in the kind of culture we are because of those changing patterns of marriage and divorce and birth. Another fundamental uh, change has been in the composition and size of our households. The big demographic story of Australia over the last 50 years, in fact, has been the story of the shrinking household. Fifty years ago, we could very confidently say the typical Australian household was a mother and a man and a woman who were married to each other and had never been married to anyone else and who had three children who were the, uniquely the offspring of that union. Well, mum and dad married to each other, never married to anyone else with three or more kids all living under the one roof today. That's the eccentric fringe. Uh, used to be the mainstream. Uh, the, the average Australian household now contains 2.2 people. Uh, and we are rapidly moving towards a situation where one third of Australian households will contain just one person. Now that's not a third of the population, that's a third of the households. Um, but that's an extraordinary change in our way of living in the space of 50 years. Of course, there are many, many factors that have contributed to the shrinking household. Some of those people who live alone will only live alone briefly. They're not committed to being hermits for life. Uh, some of them are there involuntarily, perhaps through bereavement or divorce. Uh, some of them are there voluntarily. Many young women are living alone uh, voluntarily as a symbolic sign of their independence. So uh, many, many reasons for it, um, but the impact on our neighbourhoods and communities in the short term has been very significant. We've had major problems of social exclusion, loneliness, isolation, even alienation among people who are adapting to living alone in a society that hasn't been used to having uh, such a large number of solo households. Uh, longer term, it'll probably turn out to be very good news for the health of our communities and we can already see the impact of the shrinking household on the life of local neighbourhoods and communities because we are social creatures, we do belong together. The fact that in the last 50 years we have stopped effectively living in domestic herds, if you think of the human herd as typically five to seven people, that's a natural comfortable herd size for humans. We used to live in herds, we no longer do, but we're still herd animals so we have to go out and find herds to connect with. Hence the explosion in things like book clubs and community choirs, community gardens, U3A classes, uh, coffee shops, food courts, uh, offering the opportunity for people who can't think of any other way of connecting with the herd simply to go and graze with the herd <laughs> at the time of public prof. Uh, so that's a, that's a trend that's going to continue apace as the number of small households uh, continues to grow. And of course, uh, some more rapid snapshots. We've been through this massive economic restructure, uh, which has had two huge effects on us. One is to make us realise that we do live in a globalised economy. We never even used the word globalisation 50 years ago. Uh, 50 years ago, we did use the word egalitarianism. That was one of the dreams we had about Australian society. But the economic revolution has thrown out a huge challenge to our egalitarian ideals as well. Fifty years ago, we lived broadly 
uh, in a society characterised by job, job security. Today we live in a society essentially characterised by job insecurity. We've seen the huge explosion in casual and part-time work, uh, a major factor in the redistribution of income, particularly over the last 15 or 20 years, but it's been happening gradually over this 50-year period. We now have about 2 million Australians who are either unemployed or significantly underemployed, and we've seen the shrinkage in middle class Australia. 50 years ago we were all middle class, we thought. We don't dare say that now at a time when 20% of households at the top of the heap are enjoying an average annual household income of 330,000, one household in five, and the same number at the bottom of the heap, 20% of households struggling on an average annual household income of $30,000. We've never in our history, let alone the last 50 years, lived with a disparity as great as that. The information technology revolution has of course fundamentally changed our way of life, has blurred the distinction that we used to make between communication and data transfer. It's now tempting to think that data transfer is communication. It's also completely redefined our concept of privacy and, for many younger people, even our concept of identity. For those people, uh, heavy users of the internet in the under 30 age group who typically have multiple identities online, sometimes as many as 10. Of course, we've also been challenged to think of ourselves as a multicultural society in the last 50 years. It's actually more recent than the last 50. 50 years ago, that word was not in our vocabulary. But now we understand that we have become truly a hybrid nation, strengthened like all hybrids uh, by the richness, the diversity of the people who've come here. But that for many Australians has been a sore point. It's been a challenge to what they thought were their traditional uh, shared values. Uh, they've been perhaps reluctant and certainly slow to adapt to the idea that true multiculturalism is going to be our greatest strength going forward. We've also in this half century experienced a huge increase in the complexity of moral decision making, especially for our young people. Yes, our society has become more liberal, more permissive, which means kids are being asked to make moral decisions about sex, about drugs, uh, about drinking in particular, at an earlier age uh, than we were uh, or than their parents uh, were. Uh, we are being asked to make complex moral decisions coming at us from the frontiers of biotechnology. Whoever imagined 50 years ago that there would be a public debate about embryonic cells, stem cell research uh, or about some of the debates that are now going on uh, about medical intervention and its role in death, euthanasia, and so on. While all that's been happening, we've been adapting to the idea of international terrorism. We've been coming to recognise that globalisation means we're caught up in other people's economic woes and that international economic meltdowns are a possibility. And, of course, most recently, something, again, we never even mentioned wasn't in our vocabulary 50 years ago, the prospect of climate change, global warming and its impact on our way of life. No wonder many Australians have been rocked by all of this. No wonder that in the last 10 years our consumption of tranquilizers and antidepressants has tripled. Uh, many people are saying they feel as though the rate of change, the, var the variety of the changes that have been coming at us uh, have not just been challenging, but of course many people to feel that they have lost control of what's happening. A feeling of powerlessness has gripped Australians on a very large scale. And that's had a very obvious consequence. And you can see it in the sort of television programs we watch, the kind of books we read, uh, and the way we're spending our money. We've moved from thinking about the big agenda, all these big changes. We've moved away from being engaged with that because we felt that was beyond our control, we've narrowed our focus and turned it inward and become remarkably self-absorbed, perhaps even self-indulgent, racking up 
record levels of personal debt un undreamed of 50 years ago. Of course, the whole credit card revolution hadn't happened then either. Undreamed of levels of personal debt to fund uh, an agenda which we feel we can control. Home renovations. People, we've had an epidemic of home renovations. We, at the turn of the century, we were even watching television programs about home renovations rather than the news or current affairs. More kids into private schools, more obsession with fitness, uh, our obsession with border protection, less compassionate, more prejudiced, the call for more regulation of everything that moves. These are all classic human responses to a feeling that the rate of change is such that we're out of control, but these are ways we feel that we can get things back under control. Well, that's not a pleasant state for many Australians uh, to feel. There is a lower level of general confidence in the community at the moment, a lower respect for institutions than has been characteristic of us, and a sense of some confusion and even disenchantment. It's not what we want. What we want is a greater sense of vision, some inspiration, a new story, the kind of thing Mike has just been saying about Newcastle, a way of helping us to make sense of what's been happening, happening to us and a way of helping explain us to ourselves. That's the leadership challenge for 2013. Thank you.